Welcome to Blind Spot. I'm Steve Reardon. Today is a special live edition of the show. We're recording today on the campus of Stanford University at the Graduate School of Business, live from the seminar series Moving Forward After Political Confrontation. And we are joined by a cross section of students and faculty from across the university. I'm joined by returning guest, Professor Neil Mahatra. Neil is the Professor of Political Economy at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. Neil, welcome back to Blindspot. Happy to be back. <laughs> um, so, Neil, we last spoke the day after the U.S. election. Less than three months have passed, and, um, but so much has happened. So, I guess, looking back on the last three months, uh, and especially the last two weeks, is this how you thought a Trump transition was going to go? Um, yeah, so I re-listened to the last podcast from three months ago, and I, I had a pretty optimistic tone then. <laughs> um, I think my tone has become a little bit more pessimistic, and I've kind of thought about why that's been the case. And I think I, the conclusion I've come to, at least, is that it's, it's very hard if you're a populist and you won as a populist to not feel like you have a mass movement behind you. And it seems like society is at large. There was a series of events that took place in the last three months to sort of delegitimize the election result. Um, so, you know, I think initially one was uh, making a big deal of the popular vote. And the popular vote margin, in the days after I talked to you, started getting wider and wider and wider. So that was one thing. Um, a second thing is that there was an attempt to recount ballots in three states. Um, and, and those recount attempts you know, at, w were kind of ridiculous. It wasn't like 500 votes like in Florida in 2000. These were tens of thousands of votes. Um, third, there was a big push to have the Electoral College overturn um, the election result, which would have been unprecedented. Um, and, and fourth, there was kind of various events to make it seem that a counterfactual world would not have elected Trump. So, for example, if James Comey had not intervened in the election, if the Russians had not interfered in the election. So if you kind of look at it from Trump's point of view, this is basically like week after week um, an attempt to delegitimize the election, and this is very bad for a populist who kind of depends on mass support. Um, so I think... Um, you know, the day after I spoke to you, I was mm -hmm. expecting kind of more of a moderate um, response and, and approach that we haven't really seen. But I think a lot of that is in direct response to uh, events maybe that took place after the election. Yeah, it's really interesting because I think a lot of people look at the, uh, you know, at his insistence on the popular vote and go, well, you know, you won. Why are you still hammering after this? But, you know, as a populist, that's obviously the thing. And, that and that's why the crowd sizes are so important, right? right? Like, why would you say, like, why would someone be so obsessed with it? So on one hand, you could say, oh, this is some personality disorder. But I think another way to look at it is this is like if you're having a populist revolt. Are we taking personality disorder off the table? Well, I'm, not, I, I'm just saying that's one way to look at right, it. But okay. I think another way to look at it is if you're strategically trying to have a populist movement, and you have kind of you know, low turnout in your inauguration, it's hard to make the claim that you should completely disrupt the political economic system rather than maintaining the status quo with some adjustments. Right. So I want to I go back to a comment you made on my previous show, and I think it was really, really interesting. So one of the ideas in the run-up to the election was that Trump's opponents took him literally, but not seriously. His supporters took him seriously, but not literally. So two weeks into the presidency, three months since the election, has that changed? Yeah, so first of all, I think both those opinions are wrong. I think, you know, seriously and literally is probably should have been the right approach all along. <laughs> right. Um, and, um, I mean, in many ways, I think Peter Thiel gets some credit for saying that. I don't know exactly who came up with that phraseology, but um, at the time I heard it, I thought it was quite insightful in some ways because it could maybe give a perspective for why people might have voted for this person whose literal statements, you could argue, were, were ridiculous on, on many fronts, right? So you could say well, I know he's not going to literally build a wall, but what he means is he's trying to signal, I'm going to be more serious on immigration than prior, prior presidents, mm. especially Republican presidents. But, um, you know, I think a lot of the actions he's taken um, have been, you know, maybe not totally literally, but closer to literally. And, and I think that is surprising to a lot of people. I mean, he literally wants to build a wall. I mean, there, uh, there's no way around that now. 
Yeah, I mean, there has been some, you know, we'll see what actually happens. Yeah. But, I mean, there has been some, some money being moved forward there, et cetera. Um, so, and I think also when the, the, another example was kind of like the ban of Muslims, exactly, you know, that right. kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> so it, it's kind of surprising that this is a statement he made in the campaign uh, that people heard, that people voted for. Um, and and now in some form or another, you can debate whether it's like literally the case or not. But I, I think it was fair to say it's, it's closer to literal than figurative. Right. You know, one of the things I want to kind of like tease out is this idea that you know everything's kind of gotten merged together with with the Trump effect. So there are obviously you know a bunch of executive orders that are coming out, but that is not uncommon for presidents. So how do you look at it as a political scientist? You know, what is a lot of people think we're in uncharted territory. What is normal for a Republican president and what is kind of off the map from your point of view? Yeah, I think this is actually really important things to distinguish because I think you need to really distinguish what, um, you know, Ted Cruz or John Kasich would have done had they been elected versus what Trump is doing kind of uniquely. And I think if all the protests and accusations are kind of lumped together, Um, then I think it's not about defending civil society. It's about kind of ideological uh, disagreement, which has to be distinct. Um, So I'll give you a couple examples. So um, every time a Republican gets into office since 1984, um, they stop the federal funding of abortions overseas. Um, And every time a Democrat gets into office, they lift that restriction. It's a very common thing that you see every time there's a turnover. Um, I mean, you could argue that this executive order uh, was a little bit more stringent. You know, it dealt things with like AIDS, re- you know, um, work and things like HIV work, and maybe a little bit more extreme. But that is kind of something you would expect a Republican president to do. You know, nominating a textualist, uh, highly qualified judge from a circuit court uh, for the Supreme Court is something that you would expect someone to do. So, I mean, you want to kind of put things in those categories. I think there's other things that a Republican president would not have done. Um, so it, it is possible that a Republican president would have said, you know, we should maybe uh, not you know, restrict a refugee program, right? Um, but that is very distinct um, from having an executive order that people with um, granted visas and, more importantly, green cards who have legal protections would have disruptions getting into and out of the country. And moreover, that there wouldn't be uh, consultation with Department of Homeland Security and the State Department in advance of that. Um, so there's just examples of things where you know, a typical Republican president probably would not have violated the status of people's green cards or been n- uncareful about that uh, mm-hmm. versus you know, uh, rescinding abortion funding. Right. So, I mean, when you look at, there's obviously, especially in this room and all over campus, a lot of concern around the executive order on immigration. And seeing as you touched on it, I I mean, I want to talk about it. When you look at that, do you see strategy? Do you see, you know, because there are obviously a bunch of things that happened around its implementation, and there's a lot to be said about the substance of the order. What do you see when you look at him doing that? Yeah, I mean, this is the big question with this administration. I mean, we're really learning a lot about it with leaks. So there's one theory, which is, oh, you know, these guys are really super smart, and they're fooling you all. And, right. you know, whenever you get mad, you're kind of falling into the trap. And then there's another philosophy is that these guys kind of don't know what they're doing, um, and you shouldn't take any of it as some grand plan. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it, it, right now it's a little bit too early to say. Um, I will say, though, that this is um, – I, I think there's going to be a major debate in the country over uh, what the immigration policy of the United States is going to be. Um, and I think that's a debate, especially people in this room, you know, got to be prepared to have. Um, and it's going to be the biggest rethinking we've had of immigration, I think, for a long time, and maybe even since the 1960s, which was the last, I think, really big change in how America thought about immigration. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that that I found interesting about this when I was doing the research is that, you know, so there's this Ipsos Reuters poll that came out post the executive order, which essentially says that 49% of Americans support the executive order. Um, And I think most people watching the protests on the weekend certainly would have felt like that was kind of Trump's base, but there must be people at the margins that it, this is eroding. But it doesn't appear that way, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's other polls saying if you look at kind of more of the more specific things with right. it, they're, they're more opposed to it. And I mean, the truth is, is that I, I don't think you can say that this is something that 90 percent of Americans are against, even though probably right. a lot of the people that we talk to and around would say this is clearly something that shouldn't have been done. 
Um, and if you will talk about what the strategy is, um, you know, I think it's, it's fair to say that um, Muslim immigrants and, and Muslim people in America right now, um, you know, this is an easy group to target. Right. Um, so if you're going to have a long-term change in immigration policy, this is a pretty easy first group to pick on. Yeah. Um, in a lot of ways, you're not going to get a lot of resistance. Um, so you know, if you kind of counter that with like the opposite end of things, which is, you know, um, should someone who came from a Latin American country who like you know was brought here as a child now is like you know got an engineering degree and is working for a co- like should they be de- I mean that like you get ninety percent saying oh like you shouldn't deport them and this is sort of like the opposite end of it. But if the goal is to kind of move into that direction. So the next executive orders that they say that the administration might do is what um, libertarians have called building a wall around the welfare state. Um, So Proposition 187 California was kind of a flavor of this, but kind of what some libertarians argue is you should have completely open borders, um, but then just create walls around public services. Right. And um, it seems that, you know, Trump is going to have some flavor of that where He's going to have sort of a list of kind of things that deportation orders would go on. The first would be people have been convicted with certain types of crimes, et cetera. And then the next would be what he would call public charges. So people who are on TANF programs that are using social services. Right. I mean, one thing, and this is kind of a tricky point. I mean, one of the things is this idea of this immigration idea being somehow anti-American or, or an ethical and moral issue. Yeah. And I guess this kind of splits on party lines, right? So if you, I mean, if you take the poll, it's kind of 53% of Democrats strongly opposed and 51% of Republicans strongly agree. You know, on the one side, you've got people arguing this moral and ethical, like fundamental, like American value mm-hmm. argument. And the other end, you've got a bunch of people arguing kind of national security and some more pra- pragmatic political things. How, you know, Give us, give us a guide. Like, how should we be thinking about it? Yeah, like, what it, are American values? Yeah, this is I, look, one thing I think is important to note is that um, the immigration policy of the United States is very uniquely American, and it's sort of a, a classic example of American exceptionalism. Um, and so, what I mean by that is a few things. So, uh, there's only two industrialized countries on Earth, as far as I know, that allow birthright citizenship. So, it's the United States and Canada. Okay. Um, and uh, Canada uh, almost got rid of it, um, and they recently said, oh, only a couple hundred people are actually affected by this, so they wouldn't get rid of it. But they said, if a few thousands of people started doing this, we would get rid of it. So keep that in mind. No industrialized country in the world has birthright citizenship, really, <laughs> except the United States. Um, Canada also, everyone is sort of like, um, you know, saying, oh, Justin Trudeau is such a great guy and all this stuff. Let me put it this way. If, if Trump said we should swap the Canadian-American immigration systems, there would be um, a huge disagreement on that. The Canadian immigration system is a very right-wing type conservative system um, that basically is admitting people based on skill and kind of value to the economy. Um, so, I mean, it's, just, it's one thing just to kind of note, which is, the U.S. is this strange outlier in the world, in the industrialized world, when it comes to immigration. Um, and it's, but, it's, but isn't that something that people take enormous pride in? Yeah, so what I'm saying is that um, some people do. Right. And some people say this is a great example of American exceptionalism. It's why America is such an amazing talent magnet. And I think the other side of it is, it's, uh, the point I'm trying to make is, it's not like an inevitable thing, mm. right? Um, it's not like a normal thing that the, the, a country in the world does what the United States does with immigration is actually a highly abnormal thing. And what you worry is, is that there will be regression towards what kind of a typical country in the world does with respect to immigration. And so, I mean, one thing you have to kind of ask, and I think for this audience is important, is kind of what, what does a normal person in America get out of immigration, Right. Like, I, I see what, you know, the tech community gets out of it. It's very clear what universities get out of it, that kind of thing. But, you, you know, and I, I was at once talking to Beth Myers, who ran Mitt Romney's campaign. And I asked her, like, you know, like, oh, she said, we have to switch to being a pro-immigration party, et cetera. I said, well, what do you tell your typical voter? Like, what do they get out of this? And she had no real answer. Um, and I think unless you can really give an answer to someone, what, like, why is this good for me? then you're relying on what you're talking about, which is, you know, what is written on a statue 
in the harbor of Manhattan, mm. right? And I'm just saying is that I think you can rely on that for so long, but eventually those things are very fragile norms um, that can be eroded quite quickly. Mm. I mean, the one thing I, w- I would just tease apart there is the idea of refugees is a, is a load that most of the Western world bears. Mm-hmm. I understand the U.S. bears more of that load, but us taking, you know, 50,000 is the new Trump order, but 75,000 last year, which is high, is still, you know, if you look at the load that Europe has taken based on the Syrian crisis, that's not so unusual, right? I agree. Yeah. I, I, we want to, you know, one thing that's important is to kind of distinguish all these different categories of immigrants. Um, yeah. And, and I that think, was one piece the executive order did kind of poorly. Yeah. It just lumped everything together. Exactly. Right? That's right. And that was kind of a, you know, whether it's done by design or mistake is, is hard to, to mm. discern. Um, and I, but I think I think your eventual question was, you know, how, where is this heading? Mm. And in some ways, I would say the the refugees are kind of like the initial move of it because you can kind of have a story that you can get like those Ipsos, re, you know, poll results for. Right. Which is, um, oh, you know, m- most people kind of want to be careful about who are you know putting in from war zones, etc. Um, uh, but if the goal is, and you know, if you look at what Steve Bannon has said, you know, the goal is to have a much different vision of w- how America deals with immigration policy. And I just think you know, one thing for people in the room to be concerned about is the, the vision of immigration I think a lot of people have is both abnormal when you think about in the world and it's a fragile norm um, generally if you look at what I think how Americans typically respond to it. So, for example, there's been studies that have been done in the Stanford Political Science Department that I, I think are pretty good studies uh, that have shown that actually there's pretty high support for a Canadian-style immigration system, um, which is kind of emitting, based on need and economic skill, more than things like family reunification and things like that. Mm. Um, And that would be a very, very dramatic change, um, but one that, if you disagree with it, um, you can't just dismiss that there isn't broad support for it. Yeah, it just, it feels so hard to have, I mean, especially around the theme of this seminar series, how do you have a conversation when one person is saying, this is fundamentally the core of what makes America great. It's an ethical and moral issue. And someone else is saying, no, it's a national security political issue. You know, how, do you, how do you even find middle ground? I mean, that's a very hard question. I don't yeah. have a good answer for you. Like, well, that's why we had you that. on because yes. you're super smart. And <laughs> we expected um, you to give us all the answers well, I, No, I, I think one thing is, is to the, – what's the right question to ask? And I think you know, um, I, I'll tell you some arguments that, that you know, at least kind of if you look at polling – of kind of the mass public don't resonate very well. But I think there, there's arguments that the left has used a lot. So one argument is exactly what you're saying, which is, oh, there's, you know, something etched on the Statue of Liberty. And, like, that is what we should... But, I mean, that, that argument do, is, doesn't resonate with a lot of people. Yeah. Um, you know, they want to Well, know, it resonates with all the same people, well, which is kind of the point. It doesn't resonate across the aisle, it, right? It, yeah, I mean, it doesn't res- – there's a lot of people who are like, you know, what I'm concerned about is what's going to happen in my labor market status, what's going to happen in public works, et cetera. Like, that's what they think about. So I guess an extension of this is something I want to talk about, I guess, American institutions. You know, one of the things I've been thinking about in, in discuss- discussing this is that there was always this idea that American institutions were the checks and balances that kept presidents in line, I guess, as point number one. But also, I guess, to your point of American exceptionalism or, or, or American optimism, it was that our institutions were getting better and stronger. Mm-hmm. And I think the concern from a lot of people is that we have a president who maybe doesn't, uh, you know, who people feel like doesn't have the same respect for those institutions. So I guess what I'm interested in is, do you think he doesn't, and does he actually have an ability to change these institutions in a fundamental way? Yeah, so we have Salman in the room right here, and so you know, the big question is, what is an institution? Right. Right? This is a big question that political economists um, a- ask all the time. And um, you know, so a lot of, I think there's a lot of fundamental questions about how government works that we, d- we took the, our, for granted and haven't thought deeply about until now. Okay, so when you say the Supreme Court or a court is an institution, what does that actually mean, right? Like, let's just you say it's an institution. Well, it's a building. Mm-hmm. Um, there's guys, there's guys and women in in robes that sit on a bench, and um, they produce pieces of paper. That's fundamentally what they do: is they write pieces of paper. And if you really think about it, that is fairly meaningless, because 
people have to listen and abide by those papers. And that's what we mean by an institution. It's a norm that when these people in robes write something down and deliver it out of their building, that we follow it. So in 1954, there was a Brown versus Board of Education decision, and many school districts refused to follow it for many years. And when did they start following it? When the president sent men with rifles and guns to a schoolhouse in 1957, three years afterwards, and says, you have to let African Americans into this school, right? So when you think about that, you think, all right, what is the institution? It's not the court. It was the people with guns who came because that norm was not being followed. Mm. Um, So the things you want to worry about are, you know, we have the separation of power system, but it only really depends on people kind of respecting um, what the norms are. Mm. Um, And so one concern you might have in this recent immigration order is that there's been judicial decisions um, to try to say you shouldn't do this. And the administration has tried to get around that and not follow it in various ways. So, for example, by kind of rescinding the visa, by saying, okay, well, you know, the court says you have to respect people that have visas. And so then the Trump administration says, oh, well, now these people don't have legitimate visas anymore. Right. Um, so that's not really paying attention to what the court said, right? It said these vi- visas were legitimate and you have to respect them. Um, so that's what I think you worry about mm-hmm. is um, – and then when you say – you know, what, what, are, what is kind of the citizen supposed to do, then it comes down to what a constitution is. So, um, you know, somebody, you know, one thing you want to think about is, oh, like some people say they have a lot of respect in the constitution. So, so what is a constitution? At the end of the day, it's really just words on a piece of paper. And so the reason a constitution is important is because it's what we call a focal point in game theory. So it's basically saying um, this is something that everybody agrees upon, that if these words are violated that's when we go into the streets, protest, and say we kind of you know, need a new government, essentially. Mm. Right? It's or that other things in the office, like Congress, the judicial branch, can cannot fund or impeach or things like that. Mm. Um, and and you know, when you think about institutions, they really are norms that mm. we follow. Mm. So, I mean, you, you spoke about, um, I guess, getting into the streets. It, it leads on to my next thing. I want to talk a little bit about the Berkeley riots. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the reason it's really interesting to me is not necessarily the event with Milo, but this idea that essentially like Berkeley, this bastion of liberaldom, is, you know, this place where they're not having a conversation. You know, how is it possible that liberals have gotten to the point where, where you know, they should be upholding free speech and having the conversation and, it, you know, it's, it's breaking out in something else? Um, and th- I mean, that feels like a point of concern, right? As a yeah. norm, right? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. So I, I want to go beyond this like, Berkeley case because I'm sure there's a lot of details we don't know. Right. Um, I, mean, I mean, Milo is also very famous for like wanting his speeches sure. to be shut down so yeah. he can then make a claim that the left is against free speech. Yeah, his platform is to be de platform. Exactly, <laughs> that's right. Um, and I mean, he, if you, I actually, actually I mean, I've been reading Breitbart for maybe like three months now, like pretty carefully. I recommend people do it. Um, it's, wow. it's very interesting. Um, and I mean, my, the way they kind of think about it is a bit different that it's a very nihilistic view which is well the left wants to be offended so like we should do we should be the performance artists to offend them right. you know because and we're doing, we're doing them a favor because they want to be offended in some ways um, and so I guess the broader point though is like how should the left respond to kind of increases in hate speech etc and I think one of the chancellors of the UCs I think said it quite eloquently which is you know uh, hate speech or Nazi speech it's like mold it does very badly in light, you know, um, and so you kind of want it to be in the light. Um, that's you, you. You kind of don't want to shut these people up. You, you want them to talk so they can be exposed um, and and kind of be viewed as ridiculous in many ways. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I just want to touch on kind of uh, where the Democrats go from here. So, I mean, especially I think a lot of people on the campus are looking for. What happens from now? What does the opposition do? So they don't have the House. They don't have uh, the Senate. Um, you know, the Supreme Court is kind of on the edge. What do you think a practical strategy is? Of, I mean, if you were running strategy for them to counter some of these things that they disagree with? Um, I mean, it's, uh, you know, so one thing we've kind of learned is um, presidents get kind of credit for everything. 
and Congress doesn't really get much credit for anything. Um, right. And this is kind of a foible of the voters in some ways, and something that the UK doesn't have because they have an integrated legislative and executive branch. It's what's been called the efficient secret of the United Kingdom in many ways. Um, so, you know, when I say, oh, who had the great economy in the 1990s? You're going to say, oh, that was the Clinton economy, not the Newt Gingrich economy. Um, so politicians are smart. They know this. And so they don't want to give the president any credit. And so you know, most of the opposition to the Obama um, presidency by Republicans was, if he's successful, we're not going to really get any credit for that. So the point is, is just wait until we can um, you know, have the White House again. Um, and so, you know, to be honest, it looks like that's what the Democrats are probably going to do, is to kind of take the, sa- take the same playbook. Um, I think what's going to be more interesting is kind of on the Republican side. Right. Um, because he, it's very clear these, the, you know, Trump, Bannon especially, they don't view themselves as members of the two traditional parties. Um, so it's, there's going to be a point where uh, Congress has to make this decision. The congressmen, like, they have a lot of Trump support in their constituencies right now. Um, and eventually that will go down. Hmm. So one thing we know about presidential approval is that it starts really high, and then when you actually start doing stuff, people don't like you anymore. It sort of right. decays downward. Um, and if you're already starting at like 45, 40 percent, that's not good. Um, so eventually, um, and then you know what Trump would say is, yeah, but Congress is at five percent, um, so I'm eight times as good as them. Um, and but eventually he'll go down and down. And that, at that point, the decision has to be, all right, do we kind of break or do we not? And then it might become a coalition of both Democrats and Republicans against Trump. Um, and so that will just be very interesting to, to see and see how it shakes out. Um, and uh, you know, one thing I've always said is, is that um, – and you know, in, my, in my personal view, it, the strategy on how to kind of react to the administration is very complex because if you kind of protest everything um, when nothing like – you know, the, the problem is that you know, then people say, okay, well, I don't view this as credible. Right. But one thing that the American public generally has always done is they, they don't like incompetence. Um, and you see most administrations undo themselves um, because of some form of incompetence. Um, so, you know, Hurricane Katrina, healthcare.gov, like you see just, you know, the first two years of the Clinton administration were, were you know, high signs of incompetence. Um, and so just people react badly to it. Mm. So one approach is like, you know, these people, they're, they're not experts in running the government. They will make mistakes. And, and at the end of the day, people want the government to work and mm. they will punish incompetence. Mm. Okay, guys, um, I have a few more questions, but I'm cognizant I want to open this up to the group. Are there questions for Neil? Okay, just say your name uh, on the microphone and your question. Hi, Professor. My name is Eric. Thank you for coming today. Um, as you look back at Trump's cabinet selections, they're kind of some of them have traditional allegiances to the re- Republican establishment. Some of them are very different than you know previous administrations would have chosen. And then you look at sort of, you know, he picked a, a very pro-Israeli ambassador, but then he just made a statement that sort of walks back on that position a little bit. So what's your read on his allegiance uh, in the political environment and w- how that might look going forward? Yeah, those are really good questions. Um, and, you know... Don't try and take my job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it, this is definitely kind of, you know, my own reading is this is, you know, it's a person who has kind of instincts, um, and the problem is, is that if you just have instincts and you're kind of translating those towards policy, that can be a very noisy process. Um, and you know, I, I, you know, the inconsistency that you've seen um, is troubling in some ways, and that makes it very hard to predict. Um, you know, the cabinet has been fairly, um, you know, conservative by a lot of stretches. Um, there are some untraditional choices, um, and it seems like there wasn't a whole lot of attempts to kind of balance or moderate it in any way. Um, whether, you know, and, and so one kind of question, though, is, is that um, what, does that matter at all? So le- who are the two most respected cabinet officials that Trump chose? It was, in my opinion, it's probably James Mattis and Joe Kelly, right? These are two very, very rarely respected generals. They get basically 100 votes in the Senate. So these two people were not consulted at all when the immigration orders, which were exactly in their purview, um, were implemented. So one question is, is to what extent will the West Wing actually even give the agencies a lot of power and leeway, and, and how will that actually work? 
Um, in, in, may, in some ways, you might say then maybe the cabinet appointees are maybe less relevant in some ways. Um, and there's a, I think there's a lot of things that are up in the air. Um, so I'll just give you two things. So one thing is that we've relied on something called the Administrative Procedures Act, uh, which is you know when there's an agency that makes a regulatory decision, they give time, uh, they have public comment periods, all this kind of stuff. And see, uh, what worries me about this is that a lot of these kind of acts are kind of going away, right? Because if you say, oh, I'm just going to do an order, and then the Customs Bureau is implementing it in like a few hours, right, without public discussion, comment. And the second thing to worry about is something called the Chevron uh, deference, so a very famous Supreme Court case, uh, Chevron case, uh, which basically gives like agencies a lot of latitude. Um, and it, I think there is going to be some discussion whether uh, either the Chevron deference is, is given less of, if the courts actually overturn it um, in the new courts, and then it might give the agencies a lot less power um, and the West Wing maybe more power. I was just going to follow up on your question about uh, immigration and McNulty. Um, and that is a very Stanford-based one, which is do you think it's been a very popular idea here uh, to have automatic visas attached to, to uh, yeah. PhDs? And, you know, there are periodically are campaigns to do that. And do you think this administration, maybe that will be one of the avenues they look at? So that's an awesome question. I'm glad you asked it because I kind of wanted to talk about it a bit. Um, uh, so, okay, so the, prior to Trump, let's say kind of, you know, between 2000, 2000, you know, Twelve or whatever. Um, there, this is, was a very broadly popular policy, which is uh, staple the green card to the PhD. Um, Republicans clearly even support, you know, very strongly supported this policy. Um, just it seems like a no-brainer policy in a lot of ways. So what? Why haven't we gotten this policy? So one issue with it is that the Democrats know that if they give this up, they can't get the comprehensive immigration reform. They can't get the low-skilled immigration. Okay, and the, Demo- and the Republicans don't want the low-skilled immigration. And so Schumer has been on the record of saying this, is that he's using as a hostage to get the low-skilled immigration. Now, whether you think that's, like, highly immoral or you think it's good legislative strategy, I'm not going to comment. That's for you to decide. Um, now the question is, how will Trump view it? Um, so Bannon and Trump had this very interesting uh, exchange on Breitbart. Uh, where, and this is very interesting because, you know, Bannon is a very strategic guy and he has kind of the alt-right as his audience and he's sort of, and they know they respect Trump a lot. Um, So he's kind of saying, okay, I'm going to give the opportunity for maybe Trump to convince them. So Bannon says, there's too many Indians in Silicon Valley, too many Asian CEOs in Silicon Valley, right? So you might think, oh, this is a bad thing um, from from this perspective. Um, And uh, Trump says, no, 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 like the Indians are okay, like Asians are, you know, that's okay. Right? And so maybe that's Bannon trying to signal that's kind of what we want to do. On the other hand, you have this like, executive order, uh, which is increasing the H-1B um, price to $130,000. Um, know, how exactly that shakes out is unclear. In some very selfish way, some Silicon Valley companies where their starting salaries start at that, it actually could benefit them um, because then they have better opportunity to get those limited numbers. Um, but that seems to be in contrast to this, right, in, in some ways, to kind of more, put more restrictions on the H-1B visa program, which I think there are some legitimate concerns about. And um, as I said, I've been reading a lot of Breitbart um, to kind of sense of what the – because I think this is kind of a core alt-right philosophy, like how do you deal with immigration? And I think the alt-right community is very, very divided on this. Um, so I think some of them – are very much white nationalists in many ways. That kind of European culture needs to be protected. And obviously, if you have a bunch of um, foreign students getting green cards stamped on their PhDs, that goes against that. Um, On the other hand, there's other people in the alt-right, and this is very fascinating, that kind of view high-skilled immigrants as kind of part of their coalition against the low-skilled immigrants. Um, And so it's just going to be really interesting to see how this uh, fans out. So... Um, it's a really great question because I don't have a good answer to it because you've heard kind of conflicting things on both sides of it. So, I mean, you touched on it there, especially with Steve Bannon. How do you um, – I mean, his his relationship and Trump's relationship with the media has certainly been adversarial, but there's something that's almost like a useful adversarial relationship he's got going there at the moment. 
I mean, how do you think they were thinking about that internally? Yeah, I think this is so. This is another thing I really want to talk about, which was um, kind of what, you know, how is this president maybe different from other Republican presidents? And you could say kind of how he's dealt with the press is, is maybe one sign of it. I mean, you, you would not have Ted Cruz saying that CNN is fake news, even though Ted Cruz dislikes CNN. I'm sure. <laughs> Um, you know, it, it is kind of a big um, affront to the press and, and kind of, you know, possible things about moving the White House correspondence um, out of the White House. Um, I mean, these are kind of major changes. And I think this kind of gets to this broader question of legitimacy um, and kind of the post-truth era. And, yeah. and I think these are serious things that we have to think about. And, so, I think, and I think that the public sees the press very much as an institution, right, to completely, your point earlier. And, right? completely, and, and, a, and an institution that generally people are trusting less, like with all institutions, and one that relies on legitimacy that is failing. So I'll give you an example why this is actually very important. So um, let's take a look at climate change, okay? So oftentimes a lot of us would say we believe that climate change is occurring, that humans caused it, and that we should do something about it. Okay, um, these are kind of three beliefs that if you're trying, you're kind of in a liberal bubble. If you don't have these three beliefs, um, there's something wrong with you, maybe, right? But if you kind of think about it, you're like, all right, like why do you believe that? Like why do you believe climate change is occurring? Um, and the answer is, if you look at it, really get into self-referential house of cards. So my wife's a climate scientist, and I don't understand most of what he's ta- she's talking about, but I trust her. I don't trust her just because she's my wife. I trust her because she got a PhD from an institution that another university hired her, that the NSF gives her money, that she produces research that peer-reviewed journals um, accept. Okay, So that, I, I'm trusting these institutions. But the institutions are all self-referential. Who's reviewing the climate change papers? Other climate scientists, right? So it's a house of cards that if the bottom of the house of cards goes away and the legitimacy is ruined, then all the institutions kind of don't work. And you see this with fact-checking. Like, why would I believe a fact checker if the fact checker is hired by an institution, the media, that I don't respect or trust? And the fact checkers get themselves into trouble. There was a fact check about his insult of Meryl Streep. I mean, you cannot fact check an insult. This delegitimizes um, the whole institution. And so this is what really worries me, right, is that we've taken a lot of things for granted because we've had faith in institutions and the reason we have faith is not that all of us know anything about climate science. I, I doubt, you know, there's some engineers here, some scientists, but, but most of us believe in, in climate change because we tr- have trust in institutions and they're viewed as legitimate. And once that goes away, um, it's just a very dangerous world um, when there isn't kind of standards of authority anymore. Mm. So, Neil, we, we're running out of time. I would say one thing that Breitbart News is like a lot of vices in the world. It's to be enjoyed in moderation. So <laughs> I'm worried about the amount you're watching it and listening to it. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast, and thank you very much uh, for attending the seminar. Great. Thanks for having thank me. You. Cool. Thanks. Awesome. That was great.